our memories are pretty fallible, right? Um, you know, it's it's more and more uh, we are aware that memories are terrible. And I think it comes down to, and, and I don't know, I'm not an expert on anything, but this um, specifically in this instance, is that every time you access a memory, your brain is reconstructing it. And so then it is, it is, um, I don't know what I want to say. It is, it is tainted by other thoughts that you've had since that event occurred or, uh, or there's just a, a gap and your brain puts something into it, into the memory for continuity sake, right? Like, um, I don't know, like you were flying a blue kite on a cloudy day. And when you go to remember it, uh, you couldn't quite remember how cloudy it was. So now it was a stormy night or a day, night. <laughs> um, or you can't quite remember maybe what season it was. And so you, your brain says, oh, it's like fall, so it was chilly, but maybe it wasn't a chilly day or whatever. So, I mean, you can see like a little thing can can create a bigger thing, bigger change later on, right? Like the whole um, making copy Xeroxing, right? You younger folks don't know about this, but, you know, the, the idea was every time you made a copy of a piece of paper, so I can make a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. Eventually, it's it's tainted with uh, imperfections that occurred while making the copies, right? And so that's how the brain works. Uh, so, so why am I boring you guys with this? Uh, basically, I, I mentioned on the last episode that I had done a guest spot on another podcast, uh, Suicide Noted done by a gentleman named Sean. And that episode aired this past Monday. And um, he graciously has um, allowed me to run that episode on this feed here. So you're going to get to listen to that. And I really want to recommend anybody who um, is dealing with suicidal ideations, anybody who maybe has been down that road, um, anybody who is just interested or curious or concerned about that road, uh, his podcast is a great listen. He, he talks to one person every week um, about their survival of suicide. And he's really just opening up the conversation and getting stories out there and working on um, beating down kind of the taboo, the stigma, the fear of talking about suicide. And it's just fantastic. And I, 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 I only, I did the show because I wanted to add another voice to that conversation. And um, yeah, if you can... If you, if you can jump over and listen to it, great. I, I recommend it. Um, some episodes are kind of hard to listen to because they kind of hit closer to home than others. Um, and in fact, when I was in the, through that, that month recently, when I was really struggling, I stopped listening because I didn't want, I didn't want, um, I didn't want to... <laughs> familiar familiarize myself with suicide and don't really get into hey I try I did a b c and d in my attempt right it's not that but I, I was just it, some of it just hit close to home and I was I didn't I didn't want to have that but um <laughs> and so after this episode uh which which I'm on uh, I will start listening again, but I I didn't I didn't want to listen to my own voice. I hate listening to my own voice. Um, so, um, so yeah. So I'm gonna run that chat that we had. Um, and so the memory thing is, I'm I'd like to know for any of you longtime listeners or 
um, real dedicated listeners. I dedicated is the wrong word because that puts the emphasis on me. Those of you who have listened to uh, most of this, this the run of this show, I'm curious to hear from you um, the differences that you maybe that maybe come up in the retelling of my story um, because I, I fully accept that there have been changes um, due to faulty memory and I wonder um, what has changed based upon uh, m- you know, refreshed, refreshed, re, I don't know, rediscovered, re, um, re remembering of things. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious about that. And I would like to hear, um, what, what you all find along those lines. Um, it'd be, it'd be fascinating if it was like, no, nah, you said that you, did this very specifically and then in Sean's chat you said you did this other thing specifically I'm just curious to know how that goes because I you know I've never had a a strong memory of the events in January 2015 but uh, you know I've certainly talked about it a lot and I just wonder how how that story has morphed with each retelling, with each re remembering of that story. So yeah, if if you uh, if you want to help me out in this little experiment um, and reach out and let me know, that would be great. Um, and I don't, I don't know what I can do with that information, right? Like I can't. Um, I can, well, I guess it would be good if because the argument would be that things were more true to life, you know, seven years ago when I started this podcast, as far as what that story was. Um, and I, I don't, I, I, I don't want to misrepresent that story in telling it to others, um, because I, I believe it could, can hold value. And so I want to be as, as honest and earnest and, and truthful and correct as possible. Um, yeah, so I'm going to play it. Um, the audio is going to be a little bit different. Um, obviously the setups are different and things like that. Uh, so I apologize if there's, if it's jarring when we switch over here in just a minute. (laughs) Um, but yeah, go, go give Sean's podcast a listen, a follow. Uh, it's suicide noted. Um, and I just think it's fantastic. I, I, it, it's, it's every bit as good and better than the play on words for this podcast title. Um, so go go check them out. Um, send them a message. Tell them I said hey. Um, that would be great. Um, I'm, I I I I'd like to get him on this episode, this show, right? Um, and have a chat with him about just about um, his his show. And maybe his story. I don't. I don't know his story. I don't. I actually don't know what brought him to create this podcast specifically. Um, but uh, yeah, go check it out. Um, but yeah, hey, it is Thursday, September fourteenth, twenty twenty three, and as of this recording, I'm still depressed, but I'm not dead. She's the reason why I'm alive, probably. It was a long time, two, three, four years before like suicidal ideations even started to go away. Hey there, my name is Sean, and this is Suicide Noted. On this podcast, I talk with suicide attempt survivors so that we can hear their stories. Every year around the world, millions of people try to take their own lives, and we almost never talk about it. We certainly don't talk about it enough. And when we do talk about it, many of us, including me, aren't very good at it. 
So one of my goals with this podcast is to have more conversations and hopefully better conversations with attempt survivors. Now, if you have joined me here on this podcast, thank you. If you are somebody who listens, I really, really appreciate it. If you are a suicide attempt survivor and you'd like to talk, please reach out. Hello at SuicideNoted.com on Facebook or Twitter at Suicide Noted. Check the show notes. There's all kinds of other things that you can get involved in if you'd like, including our membership. And help us out if you would. It will only take a few moments to rate and review Suicide Noted on the Apple podcast platform. It helps people find it. And we want more people to find it because we hope by listening, they will feel a little less shitty and a little less alone. Help us out if you would. Now, we are talking about suicide on this podcast, and we don't hold back. We know that's not a good fit for everybody. So take that into account before you listen or as you listen. But I do hope you listen because there's so much to learn. Today, I'm talking with JP. JP lives in North Carolina, and he is a suicide attempt survivor. Mr. JP, how's it going, man? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Just a couple of middle-aged white dudes in North Carolina talking about suicide. Let's yeah, just, yeah. Let's just say what it is. Just like you expected 30 years ago, right? Yeah, man. I'm living the dream. Yeah. So just so everyone knows, it's JP yeah. in North Carolina. We're about 30 minutes away on a good day, I'd imagine, with no traffic. Something like that. It's people who found themselves with extra money and they want to live somewhere in expensive houses. Is that you? Uh, so my, my wife is the breadwinner. And she does okay. Where we live, we are the poor people in the right. neighborhood. Number one, mm-hmm. thank you for joining me. No, thank you for doing this, man. This is great. Two, behind JP, over his mm-hmm. left shoulder, as I'm looking at him, yep. is uh, words on a plaque of some kind. Uh, yeah. And on the bottom is what I can read in cursive writing love you most, or is it I love you most? It's I love you most. Yeah. So it's uh, it's it's my wife's thing. It, it's uh, when I say I love you more, I love you more than the things that come between us. You know, it's a live, laugh, love kind of thing. So we know that you're we know that you're in North Carolina. We know that you're capable of giving and getting love. I think we hope. I'm capable of getting it. I go through the I'm really good at doing the motions of love. Right. But I don't know that I feel it. Right. We're starting off this baby with some serious truth. Bomb. <laughs> I love it. And before we get into this stuff and your stuff, what is or was your podcast about? Started it was Depressed Not Dead was the name okay. of my podcast. Hmm. Uh, it started out as like an audio journal kind yeah. of thing. I had done fun podcasts with a buddy of mine once before, and I was in a really dark place. Journaling wasn't good for me, right? I'd write stuff down and look at it the next day and throw it out, right? It's all garbage. And so it was it was a medium that was familiar to me. So I thought I'd do it. I recorded and I did this, like altered my voice a little bit, right? Because I wasn't sure I wanted, if someone found it, I didn't want to know who I was. It was like two weeks after I, I just put the first episode out and I got a, a email from a guy and Johnny in New York. I always remember my first, my first yeah, email. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we went back and forth for months and months. Slowly, the show evolved into, I was doing the show for others, no longer for me, right? As a kind of what you're doing, like adding voices to the discussion, right? I wanted people to know that, hey, here's this guy out there who Mm. maybe is thinking some of the same things that you're thinking. That's really what all I'm doing is. That's the whole point. Yeah. Mental illness is so isolating, right? And it can make you, because it's your voice and it makes you feel like I'm the only one who thinks this, who feels this, who whatever. So that's what I, I was trying to do for a good long while. And I'm now at a point where I realized I was, it was like, hey, this is what JP did in the past week. It was like a catch up. It wasn't, there wasn't mental health in there anymore. Mm, depending right. on how you define mental health. But of course you get to do that. It was your podcast. Yeah. 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 But I didn't, I didn't feel like I was adding anything to yeah. A discussion. I, almost like I had 40 people who I knew were dedicated listeners and I was like just <laughs> catching them up on what's going on with me. Right, 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 right. So we can find that if we want to, because that's the way it works unless you deleted all your episodes, Depressed Not Dead. It's still out there, yeah. So here's what I know almost for sure, and I'm working off this um, title. You're still not dead. Not dead. By most people's metrics or definitions. Right, right. Physically anyway, organically. Still depressed. I'm going to go with probably yeah not not like i was do we ever get cured from that i don't know i mean we we learn coping skills and we manage things better is it 
yeah. is it a, a chronic illness? Maybe it is, right? We could ask the experts and they could give us answers, none that we haven't heard before. Yeah, it wasn't, it was never a situational depression, right? So there wasn't, time wasn't going to elapse and it was going to be, hey, those things have cleared up. It's more than that. I'm not in the place I was when I said, okay, I, I need to do something. Right? I need to start getting my, my words out there or guessing that you are not from North Carolina. No, no, up up north. Uh Minnesota before here, Michigan before that, uh overseas before that. And that's actually where I met my wife. Ooh. Uh technically, although we weren't friends at that time. Whatever how many years ago, like Facebook came along, right? And you're just like friending people blindly, <laughs> right? You're like a, after some number of years, it was like she commented on a post, sort of going back and forth. So let's dive in. We're going to use the word suicide. Sometimes I say the S word just to, why is it, do you think that you feel comfortable? And I know that you had that podcast, so you're clearly not super quiet about this stuff and your own Mm -hmm. stuff. How do do you think you're in this position, if that's the right way to frame the question, to be talking about this? Publicly, we have more than 40 listeners, So, uh, but it's not the whole world. It's some number in between. They're going to hear you. They're going to be like, oh, wow. And you're going to be probably sharing some stuff. And yep. you had already started that most people wouldn't do it. So what's up with that? Once I was diagnosed with mental illness and I got past the the kind of shame of it all and the holy cow, this is is this a real thing? Right. And then once I got into suicidal phases and had my my attempts, which we'll talk about. And then I just got to a point where I'm like, I, I just need to talk about this. And I I jumped right in with advocating is not the right word, but I wanted to be a voice for others. Like, I don't think we should not talk about it. I mean, I understand that there are areas of society, maybe professionally, things like that, where it's not topic of conversation in general. I don't care if, you know, I don't, I won't offer it up. Like if I bumped into you on the street, I wouldn't be, Hey, guess what happened in 2015? But, uh, you know, I have no problem talking about having depression, having, I have avoidant personality disorder, which is, I bet you've never heard of that. I have not heard of that. So you're open to talking. That was the sort of the... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Long story short, I'm open to talking. You know, if someone in my life wants to know more about what happened, open book, great, yeah. whatever. I've talked on a couple other podcasts. Hey, I'm, I'm a voice. Put, put me out yes. there and mm. may, maybe it helps one other person and great. It has to. Oh, and I'm sure it's more than one. I, I just, I believe that's so strong. Mm-hmm. And do, well, I'm lucky people do sometimes reach out and say just that stuff. So as you know, from your podcast and perhaps other things, that is one among other reasons to just like keep doing it. The line I think some people draw is like, I'll talk about my mental health. I'll talk about even my mental illness, but not suicide. That's not the same thing. That's a different, it's different. a s- rather small percentage of people are willing to talk about, even of those that are willing to talk about other challenges or mental mm-hmm. health. I would take into account the audience mm-hmm. as to whether or not I would talk about it or not. Like, I, I know we're going to get to the question of who knows and all these different things that you always ask on your show. Like, I wouldn't talk about the suicide attempt with my mom, right? Because I just don't think she is in a place where she can handle that conversation. Right. Right. I mean, she understands my depression. She understands, she, well, she understands I have it. She doesn't understand how it works and all those kind of things. So I think I would take into account more what I think, and probably unfairly, but what I think the person, the audience I'm, I'm speaking to, if it's appropriate. I'm, I'm, and I'm going to assume she's not going to stumble upon this one day. Uh, only if I put it in my feed, she may. But I mean, she knows that it happened. And when you say it happened, we are talking about uh, a suicide attempt. Yes. And, and there's one. There is two. And another that I categorize as a uh, near suicide attempt. Okay. Uh, tell me more. So married now, second marriage, right? So first marriage, we, we weren't really suited for each other, but we gave it a go. Things happen, right? People are people. Yeah. Everybody's different. Things just got bad. Uh, no, no violence, no, nothing like that. But we weren't supportive of each other. Very different personalities. She was dealing with a lot of things. I was dealing with a lot of things. One day she's like, hey, maybe you should you know, see a therapist and talk to someone. And this was probably 2008, 2009, right? So that's whatever, 14 years ago, I'm 50 now. So 36, 35, 36, something like that. But I would say it's obvious speaking to other people that I was dealing with things long before that. Things just were just bad, unhealthy in that relationship. She brought two daughters to the, to the marriage. We had two daughters together, kind of a mixed family. And 
I was ill prepared to handle things and emotions just, I think of it more now, like I was just a big ball of energy and I didn't know what to do mm. with myself. Right. And then I, I'm thinking it's 2010. We had a fight about something stupid, right? Whatever it was. And, but I just, I, I didn't know what to do anymore. I, I left the house. I smashed the window on my way out and big cuts, you know, a piece of glass sticking out of my hand as I'm like hopping in the car and I'm just taking off whatever, whatever, whatever. I end up in a hotel room. Like I, my plan was to never go back. Like I just, no, this, this is it. I'm just not going back. When you're leaving, I'm always trying to better understand as much as one can. Like, what is it like to feel a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're leaving, and I am, it sounds tunnel vision -y to me. I don't know if that's the word you would use. And, yeah. and I say that because obviously the intensity of it. Mm -hmm. Also, it must have been challenging knowing if you're never going to go back. You're leaving children, and so it makes me think it must have been really just so out of fucking control you to say, no, it's worth not going back. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. I, I was focused on removing myself from that situation. Right. I was confident, however, that everybody was going to be okay. My, my, I, I even told my ex-wife, my wife at the time, I was texting her, whatever. I was like, my, my parents will take care of you, right? You, you will be okay. Right. I mean, my parents had moved, they were nearby, you know, they're not, not rich, but you know, family is, that's what mom and dad were about was family, right? So you'll be okay. And I don't know, I had thoughts of going to Washington state, right? And, and hopping on like a fishing boat, right? And, you know, you hear stories about people like that are just like go off and they just Northern and Pacific fishermen for a year. When you, when you go to the hotel room, you weren't thinking about killing yourself. You were just thinking about leaving. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking about going, like just not, not, not coming back. I didn't go far. I actually ended up, you know, five miles down the road in a hotel room. I got there and there was a coffee pot there. In my head a little bit, I was like, it was a stereotypical, like cry for help almost. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm going to smash this coffee pot. I'm going to take a piece of glass and I'm going to slice up my wrist and I'm going to send that picture to my wife. It turned into, okay, let me just see, if, can I, can I really do this? It turns out I didn't, I probably didn't, I didn't have the the stomach for it. That's not the right word, but I didn't have the, the gumption for it. Right. I was like, God, this is, this is a lot harder than I think it is. But I, so I got to that point and I'd send her the pictures. Um, then the next day, so she was freaking out and she called the police, right? She was wants me to be safe. They did this whole sting operation where they found out where I was and the police came and got me and I went to the hospital and then I went to a, a, a psych ward for three or four days and then uh, just moved on from there, right? I went and stayed with my folks for a little bit, We've slowly worked my way back into the house and we just kind of picked up where we left off. Really nothing was resolved, nothing was better, nothing was different. You had said earlier that she had asked you to go to see somebody. Mm -hmm. I did do that. I went and saw a therapist who was diagnosed okay. with major depressive disorder. I uh, got in to see a psychiatrist and was put on medication, whatever okay. it was, Celexa or something, you know, whatever. We're going we're to give this a try, right? And that was before you ended up in that hotel room with the coffee. Correct. Room. Correct. Then you go and you go to the hospital and then the other kind of hospital and you mm -hmm. see... I, I'm always asking about hospital stays. How would you characterize those four days at that place? It was fine. I know it's a mixed, it's, it's different opinions from everybody, yeah. but I mean, I was there, it served its purpose for me. Like I, I was someplace safe. I was yeah. someplace where it was just me. I was taken out of the stressful situation and I was able to just kind of come back down. Right. My thought process always was, Hey, we were married. We're going to stay married. Like mm. I had no clue. I had no, no idea how we were going to work it out how we're going to figure things out. But when I wasn't that spastic ball of energy, like I don't know what to do. This is what we do. We're married. We have kids. You know, I'm going to do what I need, can do to help raise these these girls. So back in the house and we're sleeping in different rooms now. And my two girls, my my biological girls were really young. So they, you know, hey, dad, dad just snores a lot. So he's sleeping in this other room. Um, the older girls probably had a better idea what was going on. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think any of them knew about the cutting and, and all that. So then my wife got a promotion. And she was going to move whatever, like 90 miles away. And she's like, I'm just going to go. I'm going to take the girls. And I'm just going to go. The two girls or the four girls? All four, all four girls. And then I, I have no real memories of how it all worked out. But she ended up getting a house uh, in this new town with a room 
for me. And I ended up going. So we were, again, we were living as we were co-parenting, but we weren't. We were married, but we were not married, right? We were not a couple. Part of it, I think it was she recognized the value in having me as part of the family, just not as a husband. And I'm, you know, I don't begrudge her that. I don't, I was not offering up, I was not husband material at that point. Right. So yeah, we were just doing our stuff. You know, she was doing her thing and I was doing my thing. And I still, I wasn't any better than I had been before. I was still dealing with all the same issues, um, undiagnosed with the avoidant personality disorder and, you know, different medications and different therapists and things like that. Working or can't work? Uh, I was working part-time when we moved up there and then I was offered a full-time position. So I took a full-time position. Um, not so much that I wanted to, but because I felt like she, if she found out that I could have had full-time employment and full-time money coming into the household, Mm -hmm. that that would not sit well with her. So 2013, I decided, Hey, I need a vacation. I need to getaway. Always loved the Grand Canyon. Stopped by there once when I was just graduated high school, went on a round the country car trip with a buddy of mine from high school. And we saw the Grand Canyon for like 30 minutes, right? We're like 17 years old and we're like, okay, we're just going to see as many sights as we can on, on this trip. And I wanted to go back. So I went back and I didn't realize it at the time, but I scheduled, I planned this vacation over the time period of my firstborn's birthday, which isn't me at all. She was my identity, right? I mean, it's like the whole thing, like daddy's little girl. You know, I was I was the little girl's daddy. My aunt, my, like all my emails and stuff at the time was you know, her name, daddy. Like that was that was me. And but I was just I was out there, so I I stayed in Las Vegas, and then I spurred out from there. I went to Redwood Forest. So it was a birthday, and I'm at the Grand Canyon, and I'm sitting on this cliff. It hadn't registered to me that it was her birthday. Like I just, it was just, it was just a day, a Tuesday, whatever. I don't know. And I get to thinking, I wonder how far it is down to the bottom of here. And so I pick up a rock and I kind of tossed it off. And then I counted how long before I heard it hit. Physics was my favorite subject in high school. So then I'm like, okay, it's whatever it was, 11 seconds. So I did the calculation. If I were that rock, how fast would I be going? Hey, I could, I could do this. All I got to do is stand up. Yeah. 11, well, 11 seconds would be a long time to be thinking, but yes. It would it would be a long I, I think I, I looked at my phone or something. I saw the date. I was like, oh, crap. Like, this can't be the rest of her life. Your birthday and your dad died? He took his own life on your birthday? I sat there a little while longer. I took a picture with my legs kind of hanging out over the cliff. Turned around and went back. Drove back to Vegas. Went to the hotel room. You know, I don't remember if it was the next day or the day after that that I came back. I credit, she she didn't do anything to save me, but mm-hmm. her existing saved me in that instance, right? Yeah. And, you know, it makes me wonder how many people are in a, well, I'll call it a similar situation, you know, sure. what I mean? and they don't have that thing and they jump. Yeah. Or didn't look at their phone, right? If- not a tiny number of conversations where it seems like the difference of someone dying and not was this person just happened to come home. Mm-hmm. You could argue that's sort of divine intervention. Sure. But if the person doesn't come home, they're probably dying and they're still alive because I talked to them. Do you think you take that step off the ledge, if not for looking at the phone, if not for your daughter's birthday? I think prob- probably, yeah. But it wasn't ever, you know, we call it a crisis mode, right? Like you're in crisis. And it never felt that way. It was just right. like, okay, it's it's time. Like, I'm going to do it. I think that's probably more often the case. Yeah. And I think when yeah. you're done, you're just, you're done. You're tired. You're just sort of resigned. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, so yeah. you go back to, is this the Midwest? Yeah, Mi- Mich- Michigan. 2014 comes. Mm. And that's the, I, I dubbed that the year of JP. Thanksgiving before that, so 2013. I remember why. I was buying clothes, right? And I was in the dressing room and I saw myself in the mirror. And I'm like, holy crap, you're fat. Dude, what's going on? And so I just, it just clicked and I was like, okay, well, that's it. I'm going to start dieting. I'm, you know, whatever, just one of those things, right? A moment of clarity. I'm going to start dieting. Uh, started losing weight. Uh, decided, Hey, I'm feeling better. I'm going to start running. So mm-hmm. I'm going to run. Right. Um, the year of JP. Here we yeah, go. The year of JP. Yeah, yeah. And that's actually what brought, uh, Nora, my wife, that's what, like the first, co- I told you, she commented on a Facebook post and it was about running and she's into running. And so that was what started it. And so now I'm running more and doing different things. It was March 21st, 2014 was our first Facebook message. And are you still cohabitating? Uh, with my wife, my, yes. yeah, yeah, well, I was still legally married. 
So Nora and I are starting to talk. We have a lot in common. Two kids her, of her own, very similar ages to my two biological girls. Just weirdness. Like she was divorced, but her husband was living at the house for financial reasons. So there's like all these like similarities kind of mm -hmm, things. Mm -hmm. She was the first person who I felt like I could just talk to and not. So we talked about avoidant personality disorder, right? And a little right. bit of that is imposter syndrome is sometimes kind of a similar thing. But for me, it's like, I didn't want to talk to people because the more I spoke to people, the clearer it was going to be to them how horrible a person I am. And it's not logical. It's not factual. As much as any, take any, anybody off the street, right? They've got good and bad. I wasn't hitting kids with my car. I wasn't, you know, right. I wasn't, you know. You weren't pulling. assaulting people. Right. Yeah. And so we just had this connection. So like, that's like blossoming, right? And I'm being fit, I'm losing weight and hey, things are great. Like, this is really good. Um, After a bit, we decide, Nora and I, like, hey, we should meet, actually like see each other because she was in Minnesota. I was in Michigan. So, okay, let's meet in Milwaukee. This is where yeah. the love stuff, Milwaukee. Milwaukee, yeah, yeah. Of all the places, Milwaukee. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was just amazing how much I would be able to speak to her, right? Mm. Like we just we just talked about whatever. I've worked in retail my whole life, and I used to say I loved talking to customers because they were like a five minute friend, right? I can interact with you for five minutes, then you go away. You and I were going to talk for another twenty minutes, thirty minutes, whatever, and that may be it. We may never speak again, right? Right. So this this is easy. My best friend Dave, like I. I tell the jokes, right? <laughs> and I support, I'm here for him because I don't want, the more I speak to him, the more he's going to realize well, what is with this JP guy? Mm. Like what, what's the story? But with Nora, it was just like, no, let's just, let's just talk. Then I ran my first half marathon, October, November, and did really well. Glad to say, <laughs> but you know, whatever that means. And then I had no more goals mid summer to the half marathon. That was the goal, right? Actionable. I was moving towards that and it was done. And I found myself without a goal. The darkness kind of crept back in, right? And I started being more down and a little more withdrawn from Nora. And it was some of that because it was like, hey, let's meet in the, the UP, the upper peninsula of Michigan and camp for like, you know, a weekend, a long weekend. Mm -hmm. So we would do that, but then she's got to go away. I've got to go back home. This is this fabulous person who it seems like I'm always just parting ways with. And it's still in the same house. I got my my girls, all four of the girls, and they're all fabulous and wonderful, but don't talk to them because then they're going to realize what kind of a jackass their dad is about, you know, things. You need stuff. I'm all about you. Great. You need this. You need that. You need encouragement. You need help with homework. You need to go somewhere. I, I got you. I am like super dad. And then one day I was just getting in the shower and in my head, I thought, if I wasn't here, it wouldn't feel like this. Freaked me out. And I worked for Home Depot at the time. And I went to my boss. I said, dude, I need like some time off. I need to like focus. I, I don't know what's going on, but I need to like get help. And worst mistake I ever made. Because mm. now I'm just like sitting with myself all the time, right? I mean, I, yeah, I went to go see a therapist. And yeah, my family physician gave me a prescription. Uh, well, Butrin. Yeah. And he's like, okay, we'll, get, we'll do this. So we'll put you on this other uh, antidepressant, you know, really helpful guy. And he's like, okay, we'll do this. And therapist, I think I saw one therapist and she's like, well, I'm really big into crystals. Nope. I need someone else. It's not going to do it. But other than that, I was like in my room watching TV. I didn't have a race to train for, so I wasn't running, you know, regained my love affair with iced cinnamon rolls, right? And I would just eat cinnamon rolls. Gain some weight. Yeah. It just got worse and worse. But I was on this short-term disability and that's got a time limit, right? Return to work. And I'm up against that. I'm like, oh, I got to go back to work. Like, what am I doing? And the doctor had given me the Wellbutrin and that kind of, you know, that perks you up a little bit. It's and so I went back to him and I said, Hey, you know, I, I looked into it and it was on 150 milligrams or whatever. And like the maximum is 450. Would you be willing to pump it up to 300? And he's like, okay, yeah, sure. Um, and he wrote me another prescription and they sent it off to the, the pharmacy. And all the while I'm like researching ways to kill yourself. When you did the hotel room with the, with the glass. Mm-hmm. Earlier, it said something about there was kind of two and then one that was sort of an almost. Was that the almost? So the almost was uh, the Grand Canyon. The glass, I would consider that a suicide attempt. I wasn't, yeah. I didn't follow through with. Sometimes people give me shit for this, but I say, look, you, you get to decide what an attempt is. 
And um, now in 2014, you're research, you're on the drugs, you're off work, you got to go back, you um, are researching, Googling, doing something. Yep, looking for different ways that, you know, the, all the, the typical like pain-free ways or, you know, less mess because am I doing it in the house? What, who's going to find me? I'll, trying to be a polite suicidal ideator, right? And then uh, I go to the pharmacy to pick up my prescription and they had refilled my original prescription and then filled the new prescription. Mm -hmm. So I found myself with just a buttload of Welbutrin because there were 90 day supplies. Oh, shit. Right. So I had whatever, 450 milligrams for 90 days. So of course I, I ran home and I look up, what's a lethal dose of Welbutrin? Okay. And you're at home. You wanted to figure out a way where like people might find you. Someone's going to find you. Yeah. But, right. but so I didn't do it at home in another weird. So me and birthdays, I don't know what it was. This is my mom's birthday now. Now we're in January. January 21st, 2015, I hadn't planned it out, but I got up, I took the girls to school, said, okay, I'll see you after school, went home, emptied my wallet, took my SIM card out of my phone, hopped in a car, drove across the state of Michigan to Grand Rapids, Michigan with all my medication. Grand Rapids, is there a reason? No, I, I don't know. No, Grand Rapids for anything. I went into a store and I bought anti-nausea medication. In my head, I didn't, I'm going to take all this medication. I don't want to throw it back up, right? I don't want to feel sick. I just want to be able to take it. And I bought something so I could get a couple spoons, right? So I'm sitting in my car and it's six o'clock. So it's dark in Michigan at six o'clock at night. And I'm just crushing up all these Wellbutrin because that's one of the, the warnings. Don't crush, don't chew, don't crush because it's their time lapse, right? Their extended release. And I was crushing them up, crushing them up, crushing them up. So I had a bunch and I put a big spoonful in my mouth and wash it down with NyQuil, right? So I, all this Wellbutrin and a whole bottle of NyQuil, take it all, take it all, take it all. And I had uh, my phone was a Samsung phone. And this was early days where you could track your pulse by putting your finger over the camera, right? And I'm you know, a curious guy. So, and then you could log it. So I was logging my pulse and labeling it as suicide. Wow. And my pulse got up over 180. That's about all I remember. Um, and, you're, and you're, by the way, in your car. In my car. Yep. In a parking lot. In, in a parking lot. Yeah. Parking Wild lot of a, a Meyer, which is like a super target kind of thing. Oh, wow. Um, there can be something bigger than target. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. Go big or go home. And you're just, and are there cars around? Are there people walking around? You yeah, like I'm kind of, it's a big parking lot. So I'm off to the, you know, one corner off by the, yeah, the trees, right? And I'm okay, this is just where it's going to be, right? Yeah. This is just whatever. And then I have, I have vague memories of walking in my head. It's, you know, like old timey, like, like naval shows or something. And they're in a storm and there's like on big waves and people are like walking, yeah. like on a big slant, right? Like 45 yeah. degree angle, like yeah. walking. Just trying. That's how I remember it feeling, how I was walking. You might've been walking that way. I may. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't drink. So I don't know what it's like to be drunk, but I imagine there's some of that, right? I, mean, I don't know. And then I wake up in a hotel, in a hotel, in a hospital. So it was the 21st that I did all that. I think I don't, I didn't wake up till the 23rd, but I, I don't know for sure. And it's just dark in there and I'm, you know, in and out, like regaining consciousness and trying to see what's going on. Like a week later, I remembered like the whole time, every time I woke up, there was someone sitting in a chair. And then I realized like someone, there was like 24 hour watch on me to make sure when I woke up that I didn't try to do something else. After some amount of time, I don't know, I got to call somebody, right? I got to do something. I can't live in the hospital. And the only number I could remember was my buddy Dave's phone number. So I called him, let him know what was going on. Nora had been in the back, like I was missing. <laughs> so I didn't even talk about that. So on that day, I was supposed to get on a plane to go to Minnesota to go see Nora. So it's my mom's birthday. It's the day I'm supposed to travel to go see Nora. Uh, my parents were supposed to take me to the, to the airport and I had messaged them in the morning and said, Hey, you know what? I'm just going to drive whatever JP wants. JP gets right. Like, it's, like, we trust you. You're, you know, you're a smart guy, whatever. But then I just disappear and right, right, no, right. Nora's freaking out. So she's been back and forth with my wife. You know, they knew about each other. Next thing I know, they're like, okay, you're going into, you know, the psychiatric part of the hospital. Nora drove out. She's, you know, telling her family, like, I got to go. I got shipping needs me. And her family is all like, are you sure? Like this guy is really what you want. Because mm -hmm. I mean, it was, we hadn't even been together a year yet. Right. And here I am trying to kill myself. Bye. Red flag. Sure. It turns out I had a couple seizures after they brought me in. And my uneducated opinion is that's really affected my memory. 
Like, I don't remember my childhood. I don't remember. I'm more likely to remember a story of someone telling me something about my childhood, you know, even teenage years, early adult years. Like, I don't, I don't remember. I won't ask you about them. Yeah. (laughs) We know that you made it to your thirties and then the shit hit the fat. Yeah. After I got out, I moved to Minnesota to be with Nora where she could like watch over me and I could legitimately take time for myself, seek help. I went into different inpatient programs. I was in one uh, outpatient program. And after four days, my insurance company said, well, he's not really sick enough. So we're not going to pay for it anymore. I was like, oh, crap. Okay. So Nora is just fantastically supportive. And I'm really fortunate that she is who she is. She's the reason why I'm alive, probably. Mm. at this point because it was it was a long time it was two three four years before like suicidal ideations even started to go away i remember like walking we were in saint paul um so kind of like a walking city um i was walking to a therapy appointment and going over this bridge i got terrified like i had to walk i walked down the middle of the street Mm -hmm. because i didn't want to be next to the railing Right. I got back into running and I'm running different places. And I'm like, I could go up there and jump off. And anywhere I went, I needed to know what the opportunity was to kill myself. So we went on a cruise at some point. And as soon as I got on the boat, I went and I excused myself and I found the spot where I was going to jump off. Almost like it brought me comfort yeah. to know that the opportunity was there. And, but, and um, in that time, did you ever kind of nudge dangerously close to doing it again? No, I was never that close, right? But it was, it was all I ever thought about right. for the longest time. It just was. And at this point, what does Nora know about it? Probably a lot, I'm guessing. Yeah, she knew She knew everything. Um, um, what about your first wife and your kids? Yeah, my, my, my ex knew. Uh, the older two, they weren't explicitly told until like about six months ago. In my head, I was going to wait for all of them to be, become adults whatever that magic turn 18 and now we can discuss stuff right but i i got i'm i'm at a point now where i'm older i'm reflecting while i was the best dad i could be i was a present dad right Mm -hmm. because of all these issues and so i wanted to open up more dialogues with with my older girls so little by little they're starting to find out more about what's going on and they they fall right into i mentioned like my my parents like whatever you're driving okay great that's your decision that's going on everybody in my life falls into that you're telling me this is what you want. Okay. You're not killing kittens. It must be okay. Mm-hmm. You're telling me that's what it is. Great. I accept it. And I'll make my one pitch for medication real quick. And then and you can ask all the questions you want. But I had, when we moved down here to North Carolina, I got a new psychiatrist and I was really dealing with all these suicidal ideations. And she's like, okay, we're going to, tr- let's, let's switch up your medication. You know, one of the downsides of psychiatric medication is that it's, you know, 30 days, 40 days, 60 days before you, you know, builds up in your system. These, it was like four days and the ideations were gone. Wow. Like, just like that. Poof. I woke up one morning and I was like, oh my gosh, my mood wasn't better. The ideations were gone. That was like game changing. I could exist i could go up a flight of stairs in a building and not be looking to see is there enough room between these railings for me to fall all the way to the bottom so yeah i mean medication isn't going to work for everybody don't not do it because it's medication i wonder how many people out there are like that that degree of thinking that's a spot i could end my life the day all day every day i mean i don't think we'll ever know it's more rhetorical but still it probably isn't a tiny number probably not no I mean, we have the number of successful suicides in a year, right? So you figure all those people, or oh. most of those people are probably having those thoughts. I don't know how they come up with these numbers for every successful attempt. There's what, like 10 at least, if not more. Yeah, something. Yeah. Attempts, and it's probably higher. And mm-hmm. then how about all the people who are just, maybe they're never going to attempt, but they're still thinking like that every right. day. Yep. There's a, probably a good number of people like that. Mm-hmm. So with the medication, and now you're in North Carolina, would you say it's better? Yeah, I am actually currently medication free. Working with my psychiatrist and we worked we worked our way off. And this gets into like I, I have no emotion. Like I've been smiling with you because I know like when to <laughs> smile. You don't have any emotions. I don't I don't feel emotions really. No. Is that always the way it was? Memory. I don't know. Well, you can ask your parents, I'm sure you have. They'll say, Yeah, you were a funny kid, right? You were, you know, happy kid, but I think it's it's been a learned behavior, and, and I'm, I would guess it's been in the twenty years that I've been dealing with all the different you know mental health issues. 
it's a coping mechanism is what I suspect, but it's so it's automatic. It's not like I think, oh, this is going to be sad. Let me clamp down on that. Just nothing. We're always wondering like, is it pharmacological? Is it, is it something else? Right. So that's why I wanted to see, Hey, can we cut back on some of these medications a little bit? Right. Um, and as I cut back and, and nothing changed and I'm like, well, I mean, if I don't need the medication, if nothing is changing when, as I'm cutting back, why not just see if I don't need to take it, save the money. Here I am. It's been, I don't know, two and a half, three months, no medication. I take trazodone to sleep at night. I kind of get a little teary eyed every now and then, especially if I'm um, physically exhausted, really tired. But for the most part, no. I think back to like a year ago, two years ago, when my, my oldest biological daughter, she was really big into making TikTok videos. Right. And she's like, we make a TikTok video with me. And she's like, all excited and really happy. And like, I wanted to feel that. Like, I wanted to be, I wanted the empathy to enjoy that excitement of that with her. Right. I felt like or my relationships were all lacking that. It's not that I couldn't identify that, that she was excited about it. I was like, I just didn't care. When I see something behind you that says, I love you most, and you think about your children, mm-hmm. you think about your partner, what does it feel like? It doesn't. Yeah, I've been asked in therapy, like, how do you know you love your wife? I don't. Are you not sure if you love them? I'm sure there's something that I probably I do, right? I, I mean, the emotion it must exist just because I can't identify it and I can't acknowledge it. I, I get in a whole lot of different things. Like I'm really big on social contracts, right? Like what we're supposed to do in polite society and things like that. So like being a dad has a whole list of things that you just do as a dad. I don't know. I mean, I, I, it has all the trappings of emotional, romantic love, parental love, all those things, right? But I don't feel it for sure. I use all the words. I don't know, but I don't feel it, right? I don't, like, I don't miss people. Nora travels for work. Okay, I'll see you when you get back. And my girls, they live, I'm in Raleigh. My girls live in Charlotte with their mom. So I only see them really infrequently. And now they're old enough where they're working. So it's less frequent and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever, right? I don't feel those things. We're all just a blob of chemicals. Yeah, we are. That's your combination. But you got to get lucky, I think. And I guess that's where the psycho farm stuff might help a little bit figure out something you were missing or not enough of this. Yeah. I don't think there's a, I, I would be surprised if there's a medication yeah. that brings about feelings, right? That's that's yeah. kind of psycho. That's going to be talk therapy or maybe, maybe never. Who knows? Yeah. But maybe you're just really unlucky and it's never going to change. Maybe. Well, maybe you like that about yourself. Do, are you cool with it? I'm okay with it. <laughs> it's funny because I use, I use like the feel words, right? Like I'll say, I feel this because what are you going to say? But with the TikTok video, like I, I want to, I think that will only enrich the relationship for that person. It, it would enrich it for me too, but I can't comprehend how it, how it would. Cause I don't have memories of that feeling. Hey, we're bonding over this positive emotion. Like I don't. Oh, right. Yeah. The memory stuff must be massive. Yeah. If this were a bad Disney movie with a slightly fictionalized end or a very fictionalized end, you and your daughter are on TikTok. That would be it. Yeah. All right. At what point in your life did you decide to look for podcasts that had the word suicide in it and you found mine? When I found yours, it was probably four or five months ago. I listen to podcasts all the time yep. and you know ups and downs and ebbs and flows. And hey, I don't have enough podcasts this week. So let me see what's new in mental health related podcast because I have a vested interest in that. You know, just looking up depression brings up all kinds of stuff. I'm like, well, let me look up suicide. Why not? Yeah. Right. Like see what what are people talking about with that? You popped up and I listened to a couple of shows. And I'm like, hey, this is this is really interesting. So that's cool. I'm glad you did that. How many people is it more than zero people in the world other than me and you obviously who know we're talking right now? Nora does. And my girls know I'm talking on a mental health podcast, but not uh not suicide specifically. What would you say if I said I don't consider this a mental health podcast? So that's too much. I think, I think I think I I would disagree with you. I think any suicide attempt is a moment of psychosis. Okay, so then you would see it differently, right? Yeah, I would right. because it's not it's not rational thinking. Ever? It goes against. I don't think so. It goes against all our base instincts. In 20, 2015, I took my girls to school, dropped them off, mm-hmm. and then I always say it was like taking out the trash. Like, this is just the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to drive to Grand Rapids. I'm going to take all this medication and that's going to be the end of it. Like, I didn't feel in a a psychotic break episode or anything. Is that validating my point or yours? I think they both exist. Like, I mean, you don't know just because you're in a state of psychosis. That doesn't mean you're like a raving lunatic, right? Running around. Sure, sure, sure. Right. But clearly I was 
I think I was having a break from reality. Driving two hours to end your life, that's not rational. I don't know. I mean, I'm completely honor what others, including you, say. I yeah. don't know what it's like for others. Maybe, maybe for them that it is more. But I mean, when we get into like the mental illness, mental health, some of it comes, I don't know if it's semantics, but it's we're limited by words sometimes. Right? Yeah. So. But I think in its essence, this podcast is about mental health. Yeah. But it's not about like you talked about, it's not about seeking solutions. You're not offering up advice. Right, 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 right. Well, uh, but I would I would push back a tiny bit. And here's the thing that I think is hard for some people, not typically people I'm talking to for the podcast, but like other people mm-hmm. might like to get is their default is this thing where this whole thing is a means to something. And it's not necessarily. So when no, it's people not. say it's, you're not offering a solution, my brain goes, no, but this thing that we're doing right now is a tiny part of a possible solution. This is the thing. I'm saying talking openly about it is healthy. Yeah. But I think it's hard for people to get. And I don't want to tell people what to do. It's, I just don't do that in my life. Right. But if I were to do that and people heard it, they would be far less likely to come on here. I agree. So then that kills the whole, no pun intended, mm-hmm. the podcast. Right. You know, and and maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I'm sure if I were that guy, there would still be people who would want to talk because there are podcasts like that where there's experts and they tell you and they still get guests, but it it wouldn't have the sort of what I think is a rather unique thing going on, but I'm proud. I think you'd have a bigger audience, but the feel of your show would be different. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you'd be as happy with about it. Yeah. So, and it's never going to happen. I mean, but, but an advice podcast is like a dime a dozen. I mean, I give people advice. Here's their advice. When you're talking to somebody who's in pain, shut the fuck up. Boom, do it. That's your advice for the day. That's all you got to do. 90% of the battle, you're talking too much. But they don't want to hear because I'm a little rough (laughs) rough around the edges, they say, JP. So they're like, this guy's got to relax a little bit. Maybe I'll listen to him. I, I have a sense that there's a few people in your life who know what happened on those days, but not many. More than you think. Oh, because you have a podcast. You have a podcast. There, there may have been in the throes of it all. There may have been like a Facebook post mm-hmm. on like an anniversary of like, hey, this is what's happened, and I'm so grateful that I have Nora, and I appreciate your your patience with me, and all this kind of stuff. This would have been before my girls were on Facebook, so unless they've looked back, my suspicion is that my two younger girls know mm-hmm. what's happened. I mean, they know I had the podcast, I had a a blog, I had a website that went with it. I know, I'm sure they've seen it. Kids are curious. And so they might know not just about dad's depression, but actual attempt or near attempts. Yeah. The, well, the last attempt probably oh. is what all I've really focused on. Okay. I have a question about that. You said you left your car and you'd taken the, the you drank, what was it, like NyQuil and a bunch of the medicine? NyQuil. Yep. How did you get to the hospital? Though? What happened? Uh, with that walking thing, right? So I I, th- yeah. I suspect I walked. At some point, I just, you know, whatever instinct takes over. And I was like, I need help. I'm guessing I I wandered up to the store. And then... you're, just, you're in such a vulnerable position there, though. Like yeah. if somebody wanted to hurt you, no problem. Right. Rob you, no problem. So, and the next week, you know, I was troubleshooting the suicide attempt, right? I was like, well, I should have gone up like into the woods and sat in my car. I should have uh, like... Stopped the car. I should have gotten out of the car, thrown my keys into the woods, and then got back into the car and done all the stuff. Do you know why? Uh, why I didn't do it again? No, why you didn't do those things to? Increase- I didn't. I didn't think of it. I just right. didn't think of it. Right. I was not until I was troubleshooting it. Like uh, you know, I gotta, I gotta do this. I gotta be better at this. But but a week after, you're still thinking like that. Like, I'm gonna oh, get yeah. it right next time, but next time hasn't come. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So and that's and that was like eight years ago. And I know you've moved house and moved state and, mm-hmm. and Nora, and I know you were on the meds. Now you're not on the meds. You don't, mm-hmm. ideate, but do you think you said you're 50? Mm-hmm. It's a fucking tough one, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, how do you think you're going to die? Some whatever natural. But I'm, I'm smart enough to know that could all change. And I, I've always, I've always said like that door will never close. Mm -hmm. Right. Once you've attempted, like you've broken the seal, right. That's never not a viable thought Mm -hmm. anymore. Right. It's not taboo inside my own head, but I have no ideation, no plans, no thoughts. But if you did, would you tell me on this podcast? You don't even know me. Yeah. You would. I would. Yeah. If I did, I wouldn't, I'd be saying it on my own podcast. So other other than this thing you talked about, which I tend to agree with, which is like, we're, we're designed to stay alive. Right. We're Mm -hmm. like, oh, this is just how we are. Other than that, is there anything that actually 
keeps you alive? So I've been thinking about this um, recently, past few weeks, the whole like meaning of life, point of life, all that, you know, existential kind of stuff. And I don't, I don't know because I don't have the feelings. There's no reward, emotional reward. There's no dopamine kick for Mm -hmm. anything that I do. I think it's just the social contract for the people in my life, Nora and my girls, for the most part, those four girls, women now, for for the most part, one 17 and the rest are all 19 Mm -hmm. and older and Nora. Right. I mean, I've got a mom, I've got a brother and I, you know, do the family duty, you know, the the right things to do, but I, they don't compel me to still be here. It's, it's Nora and the girls. But what's the difference though, of that do you think, I know we're probably just speculating, but today versus let's say for some reason, I'm thinking of the Grand Canyon day, not the others. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? The mental state. I don't know the, the chemicals that are working in my brain. I don't know. My toolbox is a little bit bigger. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I, I've, you know, learned a few coping skills. It was years, years since the overdose before like I had any separation from that. For a good part of it, I didn't even know I didn't have separation. Right. It was everything was well, that was four months ago. Really? Okay, it's probably time for me to go back to work, right? I mean, it's been four months. I should do something. But now I've got that space between then and now. And I'm able to see value in my girls, right? Like it was at the Grand Canyon, somewhere in there, they were valuable to me, but Mm -hmm. it wasn't, it it was way pushed down, right? It was down below all the, all the mental issues, all the, all the strife, bad marriage. And now I'm able to see those things. And I'm very fortunate. Nora has afforded me a safe life, right? I do, I work full time, you know, I'm not just sitting around doing nothing, but you know, she's afforded me the safety that comes with a middle-class American life. I'm not wanting for anything material. You know, I can always come back to this house and just it's warm in the winter, it's cool in the summer, and it doesn't leak, right? So I got that. Yeah, I mean, that is a thing. Yeah. Because if you don't have shit like that, how long are you going to make it? Yeah. And we're not, and you know, in the first marriage, we were, there was a little bit of paycheck to paycheck kind of stuff. And um, we both, you know, brought debt and all kinds of different things. So there's a lot of uncertainties, you know, and, and this may all be like, fiction right now, right? Like, I mean, if, if real strife came into my life, I don't know that I'd know how to handle it. Like I say, my toolbox is bigger, but it's been safe since 2015 for the most part. Mm -hmm. I mean, my dad passed away and we we didn't even get into that, but like, I haven't grieved over him. So maybe I'm protected from all that with the no emotion thing. Right. Maybe so. Right. Right. But if something, you know, what, what if something happened to one of my girls? Like, I don't know that I could handle that. I don't know what I would do. As it stands today, um, you know, it's Thursday, tomorrow's Friday. I'm going to get up, go to work, do my stuff. Friday date night, we're going to do something. I'm going to go to throw some axes, I think, maybe. Oh, tomorrow. you do like some new thing each Friday? Yeah, something, something different. Yeah. I heard about the axe thing. I don't know. Not at each other. No, not at each other. No. The thing about the no emotion, it's wow. When I say that in my head, I think other people are hearing, oh, he's a sociopath. <laughs> well, right, I right. wasn't, but okay, I get it. Right. Right. Like, like I have no malicious intent with anything. Right. right. I mean, my parents raised a good person just because I can't feel things at this point in my life doesn't mean I'm no longer a good person. You know, I hold the door for someone because that's what you do. I don't, I don't get anything from that. Well, are there any myths around this stuff? It's a question I often ask uh, myths that you want to dispel. Yeah. I used to have a bunch, but I don't, I don't Did you forget mem- that memory. Right. I'm going to ask you to write this I shit. Know, I know. I know, man. I know. Okay. I know. One thing that I don't like hearing from people. So we're all on a, a, our own journey, right? Nobody owes me anything. I think the only people that we owe something to are our children, mm-hmm. right? They didn't, they didn't ask to be our kids. So we owe it to them. Nora doesn't owe me anything. My mom doesn't, uh, I'm an adult now, so she doesn't owe me anything. Right. I don't owe them anything. So when I hear people say, like, oh, my mom is such a an asshole because I can't talk to her about this. Well, I, what's mom dealing with? Nora has never listened to an episode of my podcast. I have like 300 episodes. She never listened mm. because she deals with anxiety. She deals with different things. And she remembers what it was like when I was missing. And that's very difficult for her to revisit. Well, I know if I want to talk to her about it, I can say, Hey, and we used to do like Tuesdays was like Dr. Nora therapy night. Right. And we not Fridays. No, this was before date night became a thing. Right. Uh-huh. It's like, nobody, nobody owes you anything. And it's not to say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but be aware that the people who want to take part 
in your life and hear your story, you share with them. The myth is that no one wants to hear your story, right? There are more people who want to hear what's going on with you than you think. Mm -hmm. They may not be the people you think it should be. It may not be the people you think it would be, but somebody wants to listen to your story. Don't be afraid to put it out there a little bit. I mean, look for a group right here in the US, like DBSA, peer led groups, right? Fantastic. Yeah. Just go and listen to someone else talk. And then I know, I know you're not, you're not a big fan of that sometimes. No, I, but, I am. I'm, I think it's yeah. a great, I think there's a reason why people tend not to keep talking about it is my experience. Yeah. So, yeah. but I, I think what you're saying makes total sense. That's right. why I went to 12 step. I wasn't really an alcoholic. People were sharing honestly, and no one said any stupid things back to them because that was the rule. Right. That was that little contract you agreed to. Yeah. The most you say back is thank you. I was like, this is interesting. Yeah. But and it was it was powerful for you, right? Like it, yeah. The idea yeah. of the, the idea of letting somebody talk about something. I mean, in yeah. some ways, that's the sort of backstory. If that's not the right word. One of the things that over time I was like, I'm gonna have a podcast and I want to do it this way. If I do what I'm doing well, and I don't always do it well. But sometimes I'm trying to like just create a space for someone to talk about something. Yeah. Yeah. And th this is a space for that, right? I mean, I'm not going to go on a, a sports podcast and talk about this, right? Yeah. So this, this is a place to have this conversation. And it, for the most part, I mean, it has the trappings of a safe space, right? I mean, this is you and I with safe space, right. right? I usually ask this question about like, how many people do you have in your life to have a, a, a hard conversation with? But I want to back up and ask, like, do you ever have that conversation? No, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to burden the people right. in my life with with those things. Like I, I could, like, I absolutely know I could. It's like, Hey, sweetheart, we, like, can we talk about something? And she'd be right there. And she's very insightful, very smart. And, you know, and if she doesn't know, she's like, well, let's see if we can find someone who might have some ideas. My friend, Dave, I know I could, but I never have. Mm -hmm. And I probably never would. That's probably it. I have a hang up for bothering my kids about things like that. Right. I mean, my oldest is 27 now, so oh, wow, I mean, she's an adult. Right. But yeah. I have a hang up about, bug I wouldn't bug her about any real deep kind of things. Right. If I had, if I thought there was like a, a nugget or a, you know, like a lesson in me sharing a part of me with her that might, she might benefit from, I do that. Yeah. But if it was solely like, Hey, I need to talk about this for me, I, I wouldn't do it. Did it ever worry you or does it ever worry you with your, your two biological yep. kids? Every day. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, I periodically, every couple of weeks, like check in, try not to be so overt about it. Hey, tell me, are you feeling depressed? It's more like, you know, hey, tell me about what's going on. And then maybe try to put a little fatherly spin on it. Like, hey, you know, if it's still bugging you tomorrow, let me know and we can talk about it. No handbook on fathering, right? Well, there's probably yeah. all kinds of books on fathering. but Probably all, probably all kinds of podcasts sponsored by ah. Home Depot. Eight years or so later, do you ever wish, or do you wish, as we talk right now, mm -hmm. that you had died that day in the parking lot? Not anymore, but for probably five years yeah. following, yeah, probably. And part of that calculus was still everybody else would have been better off still at that point without mm -hmm. me pulling them down, you know, whatever that is, right? And now, now I, I think it's a it's a net neutral. I'm not pulling them down. I'm not, I don't know that I'm bringing them up, but may, maybe someday. Depressed, not dead. That's right. That's where you Depressed started. That's where we're going to end it. It's just a conversation today with two, I'm saying middle-aged white dudes in North Carolina, because that is accurate. That's that's absolutely correct. You don't know. You might yeah. be like half something else and you present as a Caucasian man, but you're a white dude. Yeah, I'm a white dude. And I'm a I'm, white I'm, dude too. I'm pretty pretty pale. Yeah. So. <laughs> Anything else you want to share, JP, before we get back to our um, our lives? No, we got no. We've not taken up enough of your time. No, yeah. I mean I appreciate it, man. I really do. All right, man. Take care, JP. All Good right, night. stay safe. See you. Bye. As always, thanks so much for listening and all of your support. Special thanks to JP, my neighbor here in North Carolina. Thanks, JP. If you are a suicide attempt survivor and you'd like to talk, please reach out. Hello at SuicideNoted.com, on Facebook or Twitter at Suicide Noted. Other ways you can help, check the show notes. There's all kinds of stuff in there. Rate and review the podcast on Apple. It helps people find it. Thanks very much. And that is all for episode number 177. Stay strong. Do the best you can. I'll talk to you soon.